Well, hello, this is uh, Professor Gilman again, and um, we're going to be describing histograms. So, in this video, um, I will discuss how to describe the shape of a histogram, all right? And so, this is really important because it changes which measures of center and spread we can use. Um, I do cover that in another video, uh, but it also changes whether we can use certain models for inference. Um, in my classes, it's going to be a long time till we talk about inference, but it's super important to statistics. So let us dive right in. Um, the first thing you want to look for is, is it symmetric? Okay, we would really prefer our data to be symmetric. Um, that is with equal amounts of data to the left and the right of the mean. All right. Note that when data is symmetric, the mean and the median are the same value or very close to it. When we're dealing with real values, real data, um, you can have a, be a little bit apart, right? And so what does that look like? It looks like this uh, histogram right here. You can see it goes clearly up and down. And if I folded it across this middle bar right here, this half would lay perfectly on this half. So this is a perfectly symmetric um, histogram, okay? Um, what happens when it's not? Well, it could be skewed, okay? So when the data is skewed, um, there's more data on one side than another, okay? And this leads to a longer tail, that's how we're going to describe it, in the data on one end, all right? And so we describe the data by this tail. I think that's the easiest way to think of it. If the tail is to the left, we call it left skewed. Um, hopefully that seems pretty intuitive. And so here... Um, it looks like this is probably this is the mode. Um, the median's probably right around here, okay. And what's happening is I'm going up, but I've got this much longer tail, all right, off to the left. Whereas if I were to take the mode and fold this in half, right, this side is a lot shorter than this side. So the tail is to the left, and so this is left skewed, right? We're going to call it left skewed. Um, when the tail is to the right, we call that right skewed. I mean, mathematicians are very creative, but we're not creative at naming stuff. We just call stuff what it is, right? And so here you can see, here's my mode. And this is very clearly all of the data is dragged off toward the right. And so this tail is in the right direction. And so this is a right skewed um, distribution right here. Uh, this means that if I have these types of distributions, I can't use the normal model student T. I got to use some some other stuff, okay? Um, that maybe your professor will talk about. All right. The other thing that we look at is modes. All right. Um, ideally, we would like to have one maximum frequency, one mode. Um, uh oh. This usually means we are measuring a single variable for a single population, okay? So when we have one mode, we call the distribution unimodal, all right? All the previous examples, these have been unimodal, all right? So let's look back, right? As I go up, there's clearly a trend up to a single most frequent value. There is a clear trend up and down to a single most frequent value. Here, certainly, the trend up and down leads to a single most frequent value. So these are all unimodal right here. So let me scroll down. Um, sometimes though, when you're measuring more than one population, you can end up with a bimodal distribution. You could be measuring one population and still end up with a bimodal distribution, but a lot of times it's when our measuring techniques are including more stuff than we want um, that we end up with this bimodal distribution. An example would be most physical measurements differ among male and female animals, right? Um, so if you're weighing all poodles, you may end up with a modal distribution because girl poodles are going to weigh less than boy poodles. And so you, you may end up um, with something that looks like this, where the we go up to this mode, right? And then there is a general trend down and upward again to this second mode with another trend down. And I'm being very careful in my language. You really do need to have a trend upward and a trend downward to call it a mode. There is clearly a trend upward and a trend downward here. So these may be the most frequent value for the female poodles, and this may be the most frequent value for the 
male poodles, right? And that's why we get this bimodal type of distribution. Um, so again, I'm going to reiterate, please note, there should be a clear trend up and down and not just a single bin uh, that is deviating from the pattern. Uh, we see this frequently with real data, right? Here is some life expectancy data I've been using in some of my videos. And as you can see, there is a clear trend up and a clear trend downward. But some students want to call this a mode, right? Because it's poked up. But this is really not a trend, right? The general trend would be up toward this mode and downward. And this I would not consider a mode. It doesn't poke up enough and there isn't much of a trend, right? Um, again, like see with this one, if I were to take this one bar out, the general trend is still completely downward. So this is definitely not a mold right here. So I would still call this unimodal with a single trend up and a single trend downward. And this guy and this guy are probably just characteristics of the bin size um, that I chose to display the data. Okay. So be careful about um, bimodal has to be clearly um, an up and down trend and not just a random poking out that's deviating from the pattern. All right? And then four, outliers. The last thing that you could, should consider are outliers. Um, these are extreme values that show up in our data from time to time. Um, some data more commonly than others. Uh, in analysis, they are usually one of two things. Um, really annoying errors of measurement, right? And just an incorrect value. Um, I put 500 pounds instead of 50 pounds for the poodle. Um, or the most interesting case, why is this value so different from the rest? Why is it so special, right? Um, why is this poodle so overweight? Why is this poodle so underweight? Why is this student's... Um, height so much taller, you know, what, what's special? Uh, now, it's usually one of these two things. You can certainly have extreme values that are just part of data. Income data is one of those things that just has extreme values that are not really um, measurement errors and may not necessarily be the most interesting case, right? Um, we do have a rule for finding outliers for box plots. There's a specific mathematical rule. So if you think you have an outlier, that is the best way to check. However, right, rule of thumb, if you have a significant gap in between the bins of a histogram, you could have an outlier. And the key here is um, a significant gap. I did not mean to do that. Um, the key here is a significant gap, all right, in between the bins. And so as I look at this one, right, oh, here, let me scroll up. Here, here's a gap in between the life expectancy bins, right? But these guys are not outliers, all right? They're too close to the rest of the data and they are generally following the trend. This gap is probably just a function of the bin size that I selected, um, as I stated before. However, here, right, I have this clear trend up, I have this clear trend down, it looks like it should zero out, but I've got this one value of 12 over here. And this is a fairly significant gap, right? That's not just a little space, that's a big space, okay? So here we see what looks like a significant gap. And so the value at 12 certainly looks like an outlier. And so this is verified by the box plot, um, which is basically covered in another video, all right? Um, but we can see that the 12 is an outlier um, because it's a dot out away from the rest of the box plot. Um, and so that's how we would verify it. Hopefully you have learned how to, well, wait for it, uh, describe histograms using the four terms that I uh, provided you with. And if you can do that, that makes us very happy.